I'm going to be talking about a project called the Government Revenue Dataset, um, which I am, I suppose, in charge of here at UNU Wider. So this is definitely on the more macro end of things. Um, and so I'm going to talk about why we feel it's important to maintain and invest in this project, um, talk about some of the reasons um, why, it was, why it was implemented in the first place, um, then show some just sort of the trends and highlights that you can pick out from this sort of data set. Um, briefly discuss uh, some research findings and then talk a little bit about what we're trying to do with this with regards to communication efforts around, around tax data um, in the future. Uh, so do I have a clicker? Yes, okay, so it really, um, this, this project came out of two large motivating concerns. The first being that of um, data quality. Um, for sure, for a long time, it was very hard to get hold of good, comparable, reliable, and maybe in inverted commas, accurate uh, cross-country tax data, especially for developing countries. Um, and the implication of this for researchers was that you might have a lot of different papers using different data sets from different sources, and then it's hard to know which one to believe. Um, a lot of data came out of, um, or sorry, a lot of research would come out of, for example, the IMS Fiscal Affairs Department, and they often used data that wasn't publicly available for one reason or another. And that meant that researchers had a hard time um, trying to replicate those results or trying to interrogate them or extend them. And so the idea was to create an open um, data set of, of government revenues that had better developing country coverage and brought together data from a number of different sources um, and made that comparable. Um, and of course, this kind of speaks to the, the broader discussions about uh, domestic resource mobilization, which is which has uh, come to the fore in recent uh, in recent years. So, um, what exactly is it? It's it's a cross country data set of government revenues and tax subcomponents. So um, things like total government revenue, total tax, income taxes, VAT, trade taxes, uh, grants, social contributions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this was initially started at the International Centre for Tax and Development, which is based at the Institute for Development Studies in Sussex in the UK. Um, the project itself began sometime around 2010, but I, I have found reference to this in, uh, in, in online and in reports as far back as 2005. People were sort of calling for um, a data set like this. Um, and it was initially launched in 2014, and since then, I've kind of taken on the mantle of overseeing the update um, every year. And so just this week, we're putting the finishing touches on this year's version of the data set, uh, which will be online as of early next week. Um, and so I've mentioned, I've mentioned kind of some of the motivating concerns already. Um, a lot of the time, if you were to compare data from two different sources, not only might the tax figures be different, but if they're expressed as tax ratios, the GDP figure that they use as the denominator would also be different. And um, this creates a lot of confusion for researchers. And even if you're just uh, even if you're just displaying a tax ratio, for example, um, so it takes data from from uh, all of the major traditional sources where individual researchers might have got their data before. So primarily the OECD's revenue statistics, the IMF. GFS, but um, the big kind of, or the most of the work that we do is that we mine data from IMF Article 4 consultations, which are, if you've ever read those, they're in a very unstandard format, and there's no way to kind of mechanize that procedure, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of work to just uh, copy and paste the figures and try and make sense of them. Um, but that really improves the developing country coverage, uh, because quite often that's the only source that we can go to to find out, for example, how much revenue is collected in in those countries. Um, and so the idea is that we do our best to take data from different sources and account for um, the fact that different sources classify different revenues in different ways and make those adjustments so that you can compare accurately um, across, a, across countries, no matter where the data comes from, which source it comes from. Um, so we end up with vastly improved country coverage um, compared to any other single uh, source. I think there's data points for 196 or 197 countries in there. Um, and as of the new version, it runs until 2016. So tax data, unfortunately, lags behind by about 18 months or 24 months, depending on the country. Um, so just this year, we've managed to complete the series for 2016. And I think 
I think only about a handful, maybe 20 or 30 countries have data for 2017 at the moment. So um, that's the reason why. Um, another, another major innovation that we've, we try where possible to do is to present tax and revenue data both inclusive and exclusive of natural resource revenues. So some countries have a vastly inflated tax revenue or revenue ratio because of, for example, oil or mining uh, revenues. And it's not always possible to do this, but where possible, um, we do try to present both figures. Um, and a lot of users have found that really useful. Um, I'll say a bit more later, but we put a lot of work into providing guidance and notes. So having had our heads stuck in this data for a number of years now, becomes quite apparent that there's kind of always often a story behind the, the numbers. And when you've compared, for example, the data for one country across sources, you can get to a point where you can figure out what's going on or if a revenue has been misclassified. And we put a lot of work into providing uh, notes in the, in the data set. Now, I have no idea if users actually ever read these notes or take heed of them, but um, we hope that they do because um, you have to be sometimes careful when making sorts of uh, cross-country comparisons with this kind of data. Um, OK, and so as a very extreme example, I'm going to show you um, what can go wrong when you take data without actually looking at it or without thinking, uh, does this make sense? So this is, this is quite an extreme example, but I quite like this example because it's been very clearly wrong for a number of years, but it still exists within the IMF's government finance statistics. Um, and hopefully, it highlights the importance of uh, you know, using using caution when, when looking at revenue data. So it looks at um, total tax as a percentage of GDP in Algeria. So you can see there's quite a lot of fluctuations, and that's primarily due to um, revenue from oil. Um, but that series seems broadly believable. But then whenever you take data from the IMF and plot income taxes and goods and services taxes, um, between 1995 and 2002, it seems broadly believable, but then something's gone wrong at some point. And what we found out this was, was that the part of income tax that came from natural resource revenues for a few years was classified as a goods and service tax until about 2005. Um, and then I think they changed their minds again and again and again and again to the point where these two subcomponents of total revenue don't really make a lot of sense. Um, my understanding of this is that actually this is how the Algerians have presented the data to the IMF, and in that sense, it is actually correct. But if you attempt to do any research with this, or as soon as you plug this into a time series or a panel regression, you're going to come to some very misleading research results. Um, so um, how does the GRD, for example, solve this problem? Well, we end up for Algeria taking our data from the IMF country consultation, which has a lot more straightforward and sensible data. So. It plots tax as a percent of GDP, which follows broadly the same trend. But you can see that income tax looks like more toward what the true value would be. And goods and services tax is broadly uh, even uh, at around about 5% of GDP across the same time period. As I said, we try to present data both inclusive and exclusive of natural resource revenues. So we can go a bit further than the traditional IMF source and also show um, non-resource tax, which is the orange line and non-resource income tax at the very bottom in the yellow line. So we can, in some cases, really improve on what exists out there at the moment and add a little more in terms of the non-resource taxes. Now, it's not always the case that the GRD is able to solve problems such as this. Um, sometimes the data is still of pretty poor quality and quite misleading, and we just have to say, be careful with this, or we have to say, we don't include this data point because we know it to be definitely incorrect. Um, so that's just a, a broad example or a rough example of, of what can go wrong with, uh, with cross-country revenue data. Um, and so now I'm going to move on to just talking a little bit about some first trends from uh, the 2018 government revenue data set. And as Yuka mentioned, there have been continual improvements in the tax ratio in developing countries and regions over the past decade or the, especially the last five years. And this is really encouraging. But these improvements do really mask some outliers. Um, so to go here, we see this is the tax ratio by region between 1990 and 2016. And so you can see that just in the last about five or six years, um, both South Asia and Middle East and North Africa have seen their tax ratio really take off and improve by almost around 40 or 50 percent. And you can see in the, uh, in the dark blue line, Sub-Saharan Africa has seen 
from the 80s and 90s, it was pretty stagnant for a long time. But then about 10 years ago, it started to take off. And you see the average tax ratio in sub-Saharan Africa is now about 16, 16.5%, which is quite an encouraging story. As I said, this does mask some outliers. So you have countries like Senegal, which collects around about 20, 21% of GDP in taxes. Um, that's more than Japan collects. Um, Japan obviously collects a lot of social security contributions. Um, but you have some countries doing incredibly well. You have other countries such as Somalia, and for the, the best data we have for Somalia, and again, it's probably not very good, it suggests that Somalia collects about 1.5% of GDP in tax revenue. Um, so this definitely masks some outliers. But the trend is, on average, pretty encouraging across, a, across the developing world. Um, if we look at the evolution of the tax structure in low and lower middle income countries, and those are defined as low and lower middle income as per the 2018 classification, you can see that, again, the, um, the total tax take has been steadily increasing over time, but also that the tax structure has been changing. A much heavier reliance on income taxes than would have previously been the case. Um, it's a stylized fact of development that lower income countries depend a lot more on trade taxes. And whilst that still is true compared to OECD countries, the relative reliance um, in the total tax mix is falling. And so now I think on average it's about 2 or 2.5% two of GDP only in, uh, in developing countries. But you still see this massive, um, if we, so income tax is pretty much all of the direct tax that developing countries would collect. And you can still see a massive, um, a massive heavily reliance on indirect taxes compared to in rich or, or OECD countries where the split would be about 50-50. Um, what we can also see for just about the first time in this year's GRD is the impact of the fall in oil prices in about 2014. Um, and again, it's a consequence of tax data and revenue data lagging behind by a couple of years that we haven't really been able to get a systematic look at this until now. But you can see, so I just picked out the data for some um, African oil producing companies, countries, sorry, and this is total revenue as a percent of GDP. And okay, it, it fluctuates quite a lot, but that's natural when you depend on uh, natural resources. So this is Congo, Nigeria, Chad, Angola, Algeria, Egypt, Gabon, and, and Equatorial Guinea. And you can see that the oil price fell around about 2004. And there, see, there starts to be some um, remarkable drops in, uh, in total revenue collection in these countries. Um, if we plot an average of these, you can see that in just about four years, the revenue has dropped from about just over 30% on average of GDP to about 18%. So a lot of countries facing, um, facing big struggles. And we've seen, for example, countries like um, Qatar, which never really uh, traditionally taxed its citizens, have now, are now introducing the VAT, for example, because they're really struggling to rely on oil revenues, uh, which they always could before. Um, so those are just some, uh, some quick trends that we've taken out of, of the, the new data this year. Um, Every year when we update it, we make thorough revisions. So it's been the case that for the last few years, um, particularly the OECD, have been expanding the number of countries that they've covered. So every time a new source for a country comes on board, we have to see, OK, how does this line up with what we have? Is it better? Is it worse? Does it tell us something we didn't know before? Um, and that actually leads to sometimes uh, we end up removing data. Because if we find a new source which suggests that the initial data is incorrect or problematic, um, then we prefer sometimes to take some, take some observations out, but again, leave a note and say to the users, we've taken this data out because we know it to be potentially incorrect. Or if we're just not sure about it, we'll put a flag in the data and say, this looks suspicious for reasons X, Y, and Z. Be careful using this in context A, B, and C. Um, in terms of the coverage we have, um, these are just a couple of the indicators, but you can see that um, this is pretty much the best we can do for a lot of a lot of um, a lot of countries. There are just as historically um, no data out there, at least publicly available in a, in a cross-country source. So, for components like total revenue or total tax, around about four fifths of the potential observations exist. Um, when you start to look at the disaggregates, the coverage here is still remarkably better than any other effort like this, but there still are some holes in there. But the, the picture is, uh, is pretty encouraging, and especially with the OECD and IMF at the moment, the, they are expanding their coverage. And each year, as I say, when we update this, there are more sources available to us, um, which, really, uh, which really helps us. Um, we also this year added a column for um, 
for VAT. So a lot of a lot of researchers had asked us, you know, we because we had a column for domestic goods and services tax, and then a column for um, the sales tax and VAT um, added in together. So this year we went back to all the old reports and tried to find VAT data where possible. Um, so hopefully some users find that uh, find that useful. Um, in terms of research that's come out with the GRG, uh, we had an event here in, I think, March 2016. And much like the data, there's a two-year lag to getting research out. So in March of this year, uh, there's an open access ver uh, edition of the Journal of International Development, which was a collection of nine articles that used the government revenue data set. Um, and these are listed here. I think there might be a copy on the table outside, but it's open access online. So um, a couple of these studies uh, revisited existing results with new extended data sets and find something slightly different. Um, and a couple were asking questions that we couldn't previously ask before just because the data wasn't systematically um, available. So I'm not going to talk through each and every one of them, but if some of those titles look like something that might be interesting, then I'd encourage you to have a look at the, um, at the version uh, online. Um, so it's been used in a large number of I sat when I was putting this presentation together to try and go through Google Scholar and count how many publications have used it, but I quickly gave up because it was uh, there were a many more than I thought had actually used it. Um, um, it's been it's featured in Our World in Data, and the Mo, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation uses it in their Index of Governance, um, and occasionally picked up in the media. So, like the, the goal for us is that when researchers or policymakers or anyone writing a report, working in an I.O., wants to make cross-country comparisons, that this would be the go-to data set. And I think we're working towards that end. Um, and I think we're um, increasingly being recognized as somewhere to get good quality, reliable um, data. Um, the next steps is something that we've been talking about doing for a long time and finally got underway this year, is to create a kind of online dashboard. So at, at the moment, it's available in Excel format and Stata format. Um, and that's fine for someone like myself, because I'm a researcher, and probably I'm always going to download data in that format and get stuck into it. But that's not accessible for everyone, um, particularly those that aren't particularly research-oriented but just want to get to the numbers quickly. Um, I spend a lot of time answering requests from people that want, want me to make a table or want me to make a graph or something. And so hopefully um, this new tool will free that up. Um, why am I bothering to mention this? It's nothing new. Like A lot of um, similar data sets have these online tools. but if you've ever used any of them, they're not particularly user-friendly all the time. Some of them are OK, um, but they're not great. So um, we've decided to build, a, build an interface around the data set instead of plugging the data set into an existing interface somewhere. And so hopefully one that will help users to really get the most out of, out of this data and increase its usability. As I've said, as a researcher, I'm probably still just going to download the Excel file and go there. But if you just want to make a quick chart or make a quick comparison um, to, embed in a, to embed in a report, for example, it's maybe better to have something more user friendly. So we want to try and create a, a little bit of a hub around, um, around tax data on the wider website, um, make the guidance that we've provided and the interpretation of these statistics a bit more visible to users and hope that they take um, advantage of those. Um, and so we have a few mock-ups. So we're working with. Um, we're working with a, a data design company in Spain to put this together. And so it will look something, hopefully, roughly like this. Uh, the colors aren't set in stone, but hopefully a pretty user-friendly interface where you can decide which variables you want to see, choose regions, income groups, um, et cetera, select your time frame, um, uh, plot the data on different kinds of visualizations. Um, and hopefully the software will be built with um, it will be slightly, it will be, try to be quite smart. So it will see how many indicators you've selected, which countries you've selected in the time frame, and then notify you on which would be the most appropriate type of visualization to use. Um, and so we also are going to create kind of country profile pages, which will just give a brief overview of tax collection and the tax composition in every country. Um, if you look closely, you can see this is a mock up because the numbers don't quite add up. Um, and, and here we're going to like provide what we know about the tax data for, for example, Colombia. For many countries, it might be, this is the tax data for Finland. It's pretty believable. There's nothing wrong. Go ahead and use it. For other countries, it might be, there are severe problems here. Be careful, uh, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of a, a first look at what we, 
we think will be ready by the end of this year, at least I hope so, because we've been talking about it for a long time. But hopefully this really works to engage more people with the tax data and to, um, and to work with it. Um, yeah, so the idea is to engage people, especially those outside of research. Um, and yeah, so we have a few more screenshots from this in the network cafe on the PC upstairs. So if you drop by there for a couple of minutes, you can, you can watch a presentation of those. Um, and it would be great to get some feedback on that, if possible. Um, to conclude, data quality remains an issue. This, this data set is only ever going to be as accurate as the underlying data. So almost two years to the day, Mick Moore stood in here, who's, the, who's in charge at ICTD that started this project, and called this data set better than bad, but refused to use the word good. Um, I'm going to say it's better than better than bad, but I'm still not going to use the word good for it. Um, I see it as kind of a sticking plaster on the issue. Um, there is an increasing international commitment to provide this kind of cross-country data. And we've seen that from investments uh, by the OECD, et cetera. But um, I mean, uh, perhaps in an ideal world, a third party wouldn't have had to create this data set. But the case is that you know, that has happened. Um, um, I'd also say like there's there's definitely a balance that we're aware of, and whilst we like to urge caution when using these statistics, we also want people to use the data and engage with it. So we're trying to strike that balance by saying, be careful here, um, but still still use it. Um, but we definitely see for the foreseeable future, and perhaps I'm justifying my own existence here. Um, there's there's a need for this to there's a need for this to continue, um, because at present none of the other um, major sources have, have produced anything close or anything that has as much coverage. Um, so that's just a, a very quick run through of what the project's about. And I'd love to talk to you more about it later if you're interested. Thank you.